Then I will share my screen. Okay, so let's start at the very first slide. So this is uh, the virtual lab intro. It is based on AI for you experiments. My name is Martin Wels. I work for Fraunhofer in Germany and I'm uh, mainly involved in AI for you and also AI for you experiments. Okay, here is a brief overview of our agenda. So I will give a, a short introduction into ACOMOS and the interactive pipeline editor so you can see how uh, it can be done, how it is meant to work. Then we will talk about the container specification for reusable AI building blocks. Um, I will give uh, a few more pipeline examples, uh, then possible use cases for research and education. And then we have testimonials from AI for you researchers. Uh, I'm very happy that um, they um, participate today and uh, share um, the experiences with us. And then we will have some uh, time for question and answers. Okay, so here is a picture of the AI for experiments catalog uh, with uh, the, the components already listed, but I will switch now to uh, the, the live demonstration. So this is our production system. And here you see also uh, the catalog. And uh, I will go now into the design studio, Arco Compose, where we can visually compose pipelines. And we want to use a video pipeline uh, for this example. And we will start, of course, with a data source. In this case, it's a video file broker. And uh, the next step is then, I think it's, it's the video segmentation is the next component um, in our pipeline. And you see that uh, the components, the nodes, they have handles. And uh, those are the connection points. And we see here, get video file job. This is the method that is the connection between the video file broker and the segmentation. And you see the, the other handle flashing, so it can be connected. So the, the um, editor helps you to connect the right ports together, which have the same method signature. So the, the video, uh, the, the um, visual editor is aware of the interface uh, definitions and can therefore um, match the interfaces together. Okay, then the next uh, node in our pipeline is video object recognition. And let's see, set config, no. Get next video segment, that would be the right method to connect. Here we can connect it together. So what we have now is our basic pipeline together. Um, and what we also can do is to add infrastructure nodes. So for example, to exchange the video files and segments, we would need a shared directory, for example. So um, we will use the persistent volume provider and uh, we can name it like data video incoming. Cool. So this is uh, the, the path uh, that will be visible to all of our nodes. And now we can connect them together. So each node, I, I need to help a little with the layout. Each node needs access to the shared directory. So uh, all of them can, can connect. Okay, um, then we have uh, also, um, maybe we want to initialize our models before the pipeline execution starts. So this is uh, 
what we use here, model initialization. So um, we don't in need to initialize the, the video file broker, only uh, segmentation and and the object recognition. And then as the last step, we might want to uh, have some, some insight and diagnostic information for video object recognition. So we would use our tensor board connector. And would connect it to our video object recognition. Okay, so this is basically um, a short overview how a pipeline can quickly be assembled in uh, the visual editor. And we have uh, in, in the top row, we have the actual pipeline nodes. And we have in, in the lower row, we have the, I call it the infrastructure nodes or utility nodes. For example, we connected a tensor board to video object recognition to have a look into the model, into the, the, the insights of the model. We have a model initialization for, for our two uh, se video segmentation and the object recognition nodes. And we connected all of our nodes with a shared directory to exchange the big video files. So it doesn't make sense to um, transport the video files, the binary files uh, via gRPC or some other communication directly. So we use this shared directory. Okay, so this was an overview of how pipeline composition can be done. And the next step would be then to validate it and deploy it into an execution environment. We'll switch back to my presentation. Okay, so we made this. Uh, it, it is also the, the video pipeline is also available as a YouTube tutorial on the AI for You YouTube channel. And uh, the ACOMOS architecture is like this. So ACOMOS is the underlying open source project that we use for AI for You experiments. It's a project hosted by the Linux Foundation under the Apache license, and we are running our own instance of it. So it is a clean uh, microservice architecture um, running in a Kubernetes uh, cluster. And it is very important to know that ACOMOS itself is the catalog and the visual composition and uh, the database for, for all the model information, but is not an execution environment. So we need uh, a Kubernetes uh, execution environment where the pipeline can be deployed. This can be a local Kubernetes, or if you have it in, in, in your IT somewhere, you can uh, um, then use this. Or uh, in, in the course of AI for you, we will also uh, provide uh, in, in the summer of this year a small playground where at a small scale demo pipelines uh, and, and trials can be can be run. Okay, so this is important to know because uh, the deployment will create the, the Kubernetes artifacts that are needed for uh, the deployment in, in um, the Kubernetes cluster. And there can be several components or means of execution. So we are working currently on a serial orchestrator, on a generic serial orchestrator that can uh, orchestrate a pipeline and but there are different orchestrators uh, possible so it can we can also imagine a parallel orchestrator or a stream orchestrator that uh, has um, that is more efficient for example because acomos is quite a clean kubernetes um, microservice architecture it is easy to add simply more deployment clients uh, we have now the kubernetes deployer there might also be a specific deployer for HPC environments, um, like here in the HPC client. It might also be possible for, for other environments, uh, maybe a satellite image processing. Um, this, can be, this can be done. 
um, and it is a very clean architecture. Also, uh, like the orchestrator, there can be different orchestrators uh, for different needs. So the the possibilities and the extension um, mechanisms are very um, interesting in this ACUMAS architecture. Okay, so how do we achieve all this uh, to have this interoperability? Uh, at the very core of this, we have the container specification, which describes what we expect from a container and uh, what makes them interoperable. So it is all based on free and open source technologies. There are no license fees or anything else uh, involved. And um, it is based on Docker containers. So it is language and tool agnostic. You can, as a tool provider, you can put anything in there what uh, fits into a Docker container. But the public interface needs to be described as a protobuf definition. So the service methods that uh, a model offers to, to the rest of the pipeline needs to be defined as a protobuf definition. It's um, a simple and clear interface specification, which looks very much like uh, simple Java or a C code. And uh, the communication is based on gRPC, um, which was invented by, by Google some years ago. And it is efficient and standardized communication. And what is uh, very important is that there are code generators available for many programming languages. And all this makes it possible to automatically generate the needed communication artifacts so that we can dynamically generate all the necessary stuffs and skeletons for the orchestrator, for example, to execute pipelines the orchestrator has never seen before. So that's possible. And I also put here the um, specification link. So we have this in our AI for EU repository um, if you want to have a closer look. So here's an example of uh, the protobuf specification. Um, you see it's, it's the classical iris uh, classifier example. So we define the input and output data structures and then uh, the service method, uh, which uh, is here the classifier method, which takes an iris data frame as input and returns a classifier out as output. And what we also defined uh, are the ports. We, we, we defined fixed ports uh, where we expect the container to expose um, uh, this interface and uh, we also specified a port for an optional web UI if you want to interact with uh, the model during pipeline execution and have a look into it. That's also possible. So on these fixed ports will then be mapped onto the uh, onto Kubernetes services, and uh, this will be transported uh, to to the uh, orchestrator that it can know how to connect to the different models. So here are some more pipeline examples. Uh, here's the audio pipeline. Uh, we have also the audio file broker at the beginning and we have uh, a dialogue creator at the end. And what you see here is the level of granularity. So what we want to have are reusable components and then we, we need to find a way to best encapsulate the functionality in um, in a way that it can be reused. So we have uh, the segmentation, um, we have audio speech uh, to text for German, and we can imagine to have also the same the, the same model just for, for English or for Italian or for French. So we can easily switch out uh, some nodes in this pipeline to fit different needs. And also we can we can add um, more uh, function, uh, functionality. So in, in this pipeline, we have uh, speaker recognition and also topic extraction. Um, but uh, maybe we don't need topic extraction, so we can make a smaller pipeline and the same for punctuation and speaker recognition. Those are all optional nodes 
that uh, can be quickly configured into a pipeline, then it can be deployed and executed. And this is possible also for people that are not experts for the um, machine learning internals of, of those models. Uh, they need to know their domain, how to um, work with audio pipelines and, and streaming all this, but it's not necessary to know um, about neural networks or um, other deep technologies used inside the models. Okay, so training is also possible. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, how to configure and uh, to what methods are exposed by the node. So it, it needs to be, um, so the news trainer needs to be a specific node for, for this training pipelines. Uh, it uh, knows how to uh, parameterize um, the, the learning algorithm. So the training configuration um, can look like this. So this is inspired by the Keras model fit method. Um, it has a, a lot of uh, similar parameters. Um, and the news trainer will feed this configuration into the classifier that should be trained. And the classifier then has uh, several methods defined, like the classify method, uh, which is used uh, in the application case. So this is the application method, and this is the training method, train model. And uh, we have set configuration, which is necessary for uh, connecting uh, the infrastructure nodes. And of course, in this case, if we do training, we want to have further insight into our model and we connected also a TensorBoard connector. Okay, so then we, we uh, can also have uh, a Jupyter Connect pipeline, which can be automatically generated because of the properties of gRPC. Um, so we can say, deploy me this model as a Jupyter Connect pipeline, which will then automatically look like this. We have a Jupyter node, Jupyter Lab node, connected to the news classifier. And this Jupyter node can be automatically generated uh, thanks to protobuf and gRPC tools and uh, automatic generation, code generation. It can be achieved by a one-click deployment and then in the resulting notebook, the connection to the model is already established and you can directly interact uh, with in, in Python code with your model. And uh, of course, you can use all the standard tools like Matplotlib, Pandas, or NumPy to, to have uh, to, to print diagrams and do explorative uh, analysis of this node. Okay, then we have possible use cases for research. Uh, it is possible to, to quickly configure and deploy training pipelines. We can imagine hybrid AI pipelines that combine symbolic and sub-symbolic tools or approaches. Uh, we can imagine to have reproducibility of pipeline runs when we automatically save and sign all parameters, for example. Um, we can imagine reusable building blocks for explainable or verifiable AI. There is a toolkit from, from IBM, I think it's AI360. Uh, this could be uh, a possibility to include some of those nodes into, um, into the virtual lab. And of course, it is also possible to imagine, it is not yet uh, implemented, but it can be done to do AutoML um, by reconfiguring the topology automatically after each run. So that there will be a node at the end of the pipeline that evaluates um, the training results and based on this changes the topology and the learning parameters for the following run and the orchestrator can this take into account and then um, execute the pipeline with the new hyperparameters and um, maybe uh, differently connected. So the nodes need to be uh, the same but they can be differently connected. Okay, then we have possible use cases also for education. We can imagine life classes and exercises with Jupyter Connect. It is possible to uh, implement 
parts of a pipeline, uh, a, a specific node, for example, as part of, a, of an exercise. It also can be then executed and checked if it's if it's really working. And it is, can also be possibly, it can be used to explain AI concepts using those pipelines or also then um, different scenarios. Okay. So this was uh, the first part on um, the virtual lab functionality and possible use cases. And we come now to the testimonials. So uh, the first one um, is Peter Schiller from uh, TU Wien. And um, so I give now the word to Peter and I will present the slides. Thank you, Martin. Um, you can go to the next slide, I think, yeah. So, uh, from my point of view, the vision of this uh, ai for You experiment is that uh, we make uh, our assets that we have more useful, usable, and used. This is, this. I did not invent this. This is uh, from Alessandro, I think, that we, we have this as a goal. So we have useful assets. We all have that. But we also, so that others can use them and that they get spread in the world, we need to make them usable and they need to get used. So to make them usable, maybe they are difficult to set up. So we can use Akumos for that. We put it into a Docker container and then it is much more easy to use Akumos to combine it also with other assets. And we also need to create something around of our assets to demonstrate them, to give a demo. And this is also where Akumos forces us to do this, more or less, because just a building block on this canvas of the Aku Design Studio uh, does not do much. We need to have some kind of interaction. And then they can become used, the assets. Now you can go to the next slide. So, I'm leading the task 7.8 in AI for you. This task uh, is about uh, encouraging everyone to create such uh, Akumos pipelines. We have two types of Akumos uh, pipelines. Actually, we don't call them pipelines anymore because we found out that we will need topologies. So we call them experiments and hello worlds. The experiments are created by each of the focus groups in AI for you. Variable, verifiable, explainable, physical, collaborative, and integrative AI. And each of them contributes at least one experiment. And this is based on an existing research asset with the interfaces and a use case around. And the idea is that everyone with access to Kubernetes, maybe a local Kubernetes, a mini cube, can run this. And then there are the proof of concepts, small hello world examples, the target group are developers of AI for you experiments. Everyone who wants to start developing for this Akumos infrastructure. The idea is that they are simple enough to be taken as a template. And the first runnable Hello World is the Sudoku Design Assistant. It is on GitHub. You can go to the next slide. This is just two screenshots of the user interface. I made this, it's a web interface. It is very ugly because I'm not good at web interfaces, but it shows uh, that it works. So on the left side, you see, you can click and select some numbers. On the right hand, on the right -hand side, you see there's a partial solution to the Sudoku where this one green square is fixed to the number six. And there are some fields that are not known and some fields are known. We just send this to an answer set solver and take the first 10 results. And then we show what are the same num what are the equal numbers and show this as a partial solution. And then the user can interactively continue to build the Sudoku. And uh, if there is a conflict, the solver also shows which fields are involved in the conflict. This is a tiny bit of explainability demonstration so that the user can fix the Sudoku. Now you can go to the Next slide. And 
How does this Sudoku example look like? There are three components. At the top, there's the web user interface. In the middle is the design evaluator, and below is the ASP solver. The only generic component is the ASP solver. The other components are here to, in the middle, there is the logic to transform the Sudoku into an ASP program and the ASP answer set into an explanation of what's happening in the Sudoku. And the web GUI just takes the user clicks and sends it to the design evaluator and displays the result. And so here we had to implement five services. The field, all the field squares, rounded squares are services. And this way we get also a linear pipeline somehow from top left, we go down, evaluation request, the job preparer, ASP solver, and then we go up again to display it in the user interface. Now you can go to the next slide. And this is how it looks in the Arco Compose Design Studio. Here we see we have cycles. Because we have three components, three Docker containers, and from the top, we have two connections to the next one down. One connection goes downwards and one goes upwards. That's why they are painted in such a strange way. And yeah, so we are currently working on making this deployable and also orchestratable in Acumos. And I think, was this already the last slide? Yes. Yes, okay. And that's it from my side. Thank you. Ah, and I'm working on de deactivating this automatic layouting because it is very annoying also for me. <laughs> okay. I'm glad to hear this. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. You're welcome. So the next one is uh, Salvo, also from AI4U. So Salvo, I give you the floor. Yeah, thanks. So let me just present you our experience from uh, realizing uh, a few, the publication, the preparation, the components uh, uh, to be published within Acumas about uh, explainable AI methods. Uh, if you go to the next slide, yeah. So this is basically the general approach that we are trying to follow. So having uh, any type of, uh, uh, let's say, classifier at the moment, we are focusing on tabular data uh, just for starting. Uh, the objective is to uh, have a component that is able to explain which is the outcome of this of uh, any classifier accordingly to a specific record instance that is arrived. Uh, within AI for AU in the WP7, we developed a, a library of several uh, explanation methods. Many of these are model agnostic, let's say they do not make any assumption on the model that is used. So they are the, uh, let's say a natural candidate to be transformed into a component. Uh, I'm going to present you also the point of view of uh, uh, me and many of the research in the work package that has never been working on uh, this kind of technology. So just to give you an idea of how much uh, uh, effort it may be necessary to get uh, familiar with this particular kind of approach. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we started, uh, let's say, from having all these library of methods implemented into Python and by using, um, uh, let's say, in this case, you can see a Upyter notebook, a, a sort of self-explained notebook to show how to use the library. So what does it mean to transform this particular implementation into an Acumos component? Well, the, uh, the, the, let's say the main limitation of this kind of representation is that probably for the, for experts, for computer science people, it's something that is quite familiar, but for, let's say, a general public may not be so useful directly. Also, in particular instances, there may be problem caused by incompatible, incompatible libraries. Let's say, just think for image classification and the conflict of resolution among, let's say, TensorFlow version 2 and version 1, okay? So we started working on packaging our different uh, methods within a component. So we 
starting from the initial implementation, so we had clear, which is the signature of all the function. Next slide. Uh, we started by implementing these uh, protobuf interfaces. Again, probably this one, one uh, of the step that was a little bit more delicate because we need to get familiarity with the, the tool, uh, with the language. Uh, of course, there is a little bit of change of perspective on how you define things in this particular kind of uh, um, uh, language. But at the end, uh, we finally were able to define, let's say, these, uh, uh, which are the old interfaces that are involved into this process. And uh, once we made the first one, all the others uh, interfaces were, were really, really easy then to, to be implemented. Uh, then we have the library, we have the interface. Next slide. We just added the, uh, let's say, code that basically make uh, the, the connection among the interface that is expected by the tool, by Acumos, by the platform, and the internal logic of our library. So this kind of things, of course, was really, really easy. Also because, let's say, the protobuf, uh, uh, the gRPC implementation gives a lot of utilities to generate automatically uh, skeleton and stub for accessing the different parts. And once uh, we have finished with this particular kind of view and making uh, all the tests, uh, uh, in the next step, uh, next slide, we then we can package everything within a Docker container. From this point on, okay, so this, the creation of this container, for those that are familiar with Docker, is really, really easy. Uh, for those that uh, has, never, uh, has never created a, a Docker container, it's not that difficult, there are a lot of tutorials. But once the container has been created, from this point on, uh, let's say Acumos makes uh, its own magic, so everything is working as demonstrated by um, uh, Martin and Peter just uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, just for the last slide, the let's say we have a, a, how to say a library that is mainly available as a Python, uh, let's say library that can, can accompany, let's say code. But indeed, the the opportunity of having this encapsulated within. Uh, uh, one or more components gives the possibility to use it to use uh, to exploit uh, this kind of functionality and makes, uh, let's say, the explainable uh, outcome of the classifier explainable to, to a large public. Uh, the, at the moment, let's say, the, the initial difficulties were just to get familiarity with the new approach, but uh, Again, as I said before, once uh, we completed the first component, the other one were quite straightforward. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Salvo, for this presentation. And uh, we have a third testimonial, uh, which is Uwe. So, Uwe, I give you the floor, please. Thank you. Um, so my testimonial is coming from a slightly different point of view because I'm uh, I'm also part of uh, AI for you. But uh, recently, I started working in AI Plan for You, uh, which is about bridging, uh, bringing the AI AI planning to the uh, European AI on demand platform. Uh, so I will just give a short overview of uh, the project and then uh, how we think that uh, the AI we experiments platform can help us to bring our components uh, to the community in a better way. Uh, next slide, please. So the goal of our project is to uh, create a unified planning framework uh, with the idea of uh, making uh, planning technology easier to uh, utilize and to access. And so this uh, so-called UPF has uh, essentially many planners under the same hood and then exposing, it, exposing them through one unified API. Uh, and then uh, using this planning framework, internally uh, it will select the right tool for the job, so to say. And then we have uh, many industrial use cases uh, coming from a lot of different partners across different industrial domains in the project. And for each of those, uh, we want to utilize planning technology to, uh, to help them do things better. And uh, for this, we have these technology-specific bridges, uh, as you can see on the picture to the right here, 
which essentially connect to the planning technology. And um, here, uh, so the project just started very recently, so the discussions are still very initial, but uh, we're probably going to use uh, also the same technology that uh, is used by Acumos uh, and surrounding uh, things like Protobuf and gRPC also internally to connect, for example, these planning engines to the unified API, uh, which I think will make it very easy for us to, to expose our technology to the platform in, component, in a component-wise way, but also then to connect them, to connect the, uh, the UPF to these technology-specific bridges. Um, so just as a very short overview. Um, so uh, yeah, if you could go to the next slide, please. So here are the things that I can see as the added value that we could get via the AI for your experiments uh, platform. Uh, I divided it in three uh, categories. I think one is revolving around the, the UPF usage and extensions, because with this platform, I think we can make it very easy for others to access our technology. Uh, if you have, you have seen uh, in many slides before now, these, uh, this Acumos interface where you can just drag and drop components and connect them. And I think that makes a very nice way to just get, give access to something without um, like, um, how to say, go to, to, uh, to a GitHub repository somewhere and then somehow write your own blue code to your application. Um, I think it could make it easier to create new use cases and uh, to create these uh, technology-specific bridges, for example, in Acumos. I know Martin said earlier that um, all the boxes in Acumos should be, uh, how to say, application independent, but I think it could. I could see also cases where you just have a create a custom box just to connect to the technology uh, that your use case needs. Um, I think it would make it easy to build systems uh, using the UPF and also to extend the UPF as new planners. Since we use the same kind of technology internally, I could also see cases where we basically could, could recreate the behavior of the UPF with an Acumos, although we have not really planned or talked about that internally yet. Um, and another interesting point is this integration with uh, the AI for your education. And I think Martin already hinted at something similar because we have talked in this, this, about this also in AI for you, uh, this integration between these Jupyter notebooks and uh, components on the platform. Um, the second part is integration with planning adjacent technology, uh, things like plan execution, for example, which uh, we're not directly addressing in the AI plan for you. But uh, if there are generic components for this, this could be something very easy to just bring together. Uh, mixed initiative planning, which allows essentially humans to plan together with an automated system, or things like goal reasoning to come up with reasonable goals for a planner and state updates. And there's many other things that I'm potentially forgetting here. And then also, finally, uh, integration with other branches of AI. So can we, for example, easily hook up a learner with a planner, whereas a planner may be used to collect data and then uh, lead to a box which has all of this data in it that we can then hook up to some learning system and so on and so forth. So these are the things that I uh, could see how um, we could use the AI, AI for you experience platform uh, first to enrich what we're doing, but then also to connect what we're doing in AI plan for you uh, in future projects and uh, potentially with other projects uh, going on right now. Uh, so next slide, please. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, um, Uwe and all, all uh, other testimonials. I think uh, we gave now a, a, a quite good overview and uh, I think we are now ready to take your questions. Are there any questions? No questions at all? Okay. Well, in that case, um, I, I think we can uh, close the meeting. Uh, we will share the recording. And uh, if you have any questions uh, later on, 
please uh, feel free to to contact um, me or uh, work package aid leader and uh, uh, ask the, your questions i will happy to sorry answer. martin um can I ask a question? Uh, uh, yes, sorry for, yes, for the delay. <laughs> Just uh, well, maybe it's a side question, but it was uh, it occurred to me what what is the um, intellectual property um, setup for for this kind of of platform? So if you if you add something and if, if you want to to um, have a company or have your own business doing uh, exploitation of of these platform with additional tools or without additional tools how does it work okay very good question very good question so um if you publish a model in, in the ecomos catalog it needs to have license information so that's mandatory each model must have a license associated with it and it can be uh, a, a, an open source license but it also can be a proprietary license and it can be uh, it's a structured editor but it can be freely uh, adopted to to the needs of uh, specific companies so this is uh, definitely allowed to have commercial and proprietary licenses um, on the platform and it is also possible to create let's say private working groups so if you don't publish your asset your your tool you can share it with other users and by this you can create mixed teams on acomos to work together on on different um, tools or on pipelines to make proof of concept and and first uh, uh, minimal viable prototypes okay thank you uh, actually, this also relates to something I wanted to ask. So you can have private components in Acumos. Uh, so let's say I create something that I don't think is valuable for anyone else because it just relates to one of the use cases I'm working on, or I just want to try to connect things and to see if it runs. So there is no requirement to absolutely publish everything. That's uh, correct. So then those are two different steps. The first step is onboarding, which will be only visible privately or mm -hmm. shared with uh, other dedicated users and a second and separate step <coughs> is then to publish the model into the catalog and uh, it's it's not uh, connected and it's not mandatory to publish uh, every model it's it's up to the user um, what the current use case uh, is Okay, that's really good to know because I don't think all the things that, especially if you think about these te technology specific bridges, let's say I want to uh, upload one of those and then connect it to our framework. Uh, we don't necessarily want to publish this one because it's not really interesting for anyone else because it only provides something to our specific use case. Yes, okay. so it's perfectly possible. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? That doesn't seem to be the case then i think we can close the meeting so thank you very much for joining and uh, see you soon in the next human ai meeting thank you bye 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 thank you martin thank, thank you, you. Bye -bye. thank you for the presentations bye bye, bye, -bye. Yeah.